come to know today as being Easter Sunday. It is the day that we, as Christians, celebrate. And I want to emphasize that word, we celebrate this morning, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. But over the past number of weeks, we have been preaching through a series entitled, Why Jesus? Because of the centrality of Jesus to the Christian faith. In fact, Jesus highlights the importance of this issue with two questions that he asks his disciples one day. First, the first one is, who do men, who do people say that I am? What, what's the general opinion out there about me? But then he always does uh, something unusual. He comes and he says to them, but who do you say that I am? And, he, and, and that's the challenge that always comes to us as believers. Not, not what do other people think, but what do you think? What do you believe? What do you say? And Peter uh, proclaims and makes that wonderful uh, profession. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and of course, this is an issue that's still being debated and discussed today because of the way the Christian message is spreading all over the world and impacting people's lives. So that's always going to bring about a debate around who Jesus is. Over the past few weeks, we've looked at what different religions believe about Jesus. The fact that he, he claimed to be a person just like us and yet was without sin. Over and over, the way that he claimed to be God. And then on Friday, we looked at how God actually forsook him on the cross when he was crucified. But it's the claims that the Christian faith make about Jesus, who he said he was. He said he was the Son of God, who he claimed to be, the Messiah. And especially that he rose from the dead that tend to be so controversial. Over the centuries, in fact, the biggest debate and discussion continues to be about the resurrection. The claims that the New Testament writers make that Jesus physically rose from the dead. And this is the big issue. Did he physically rise from the dead? After being certified dead by a Roman soldier who then took a spear and shoved it through his side. And the Bible tells us that blood and water flowed out of his chest. In John 19, when they came to Jesus and they found he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. And so this was just to make sure they pierced his side with a spear. In Matthew 28, we, we read that account of the resurrection after the Sabbath at dawn and the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene, remember that she became one of the close followers of Jesus. And the other Mary went to look at the tomb. And there was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. And the gods were so afraid of him that they shook and they became like dead men. In other words, they kind of fainted. And the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's risen. Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. And then go quickly and tell his disciples, he's risen from the dead and he's going ahead of you into Galilee. And there you will see him. Now I've told you. So the woman hurried away from the tomb, afraid and yet filled with joy, and they ran to tell his disciples. And you know, when I look and when I begin to read, and as I begin to investigate and explore the reason that there is so much first-hand evidence for the resurrection in the Bible, is to ensure that while from a human point of view, the physical resurrection of Jesus sounds really far-fetched, it can be very far. It can be investigated. It was not the figment of someone's overactive imagination. In fact, the resurrection is so central to the Christian faith that virtually everything that Christians believe is a waste of time if that's not true. When Paul was writing to the, the Corinthian church and he saw that they'd begun to embrace some of the teaching of the day, he has to say to them, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. Friends, here's one of the things that struck me about that scripture. 
When we doubt the resurrection without realizing it, it undermines everything that we begin to believe. The Corinthians weren't aware of it and say he has to spell it out. He has to say to them, I want you to realize that when you start embracing other teaching, it starts to impact your very faith, the very core of your faith. More than that, he goes on to say, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we've testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But... But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins. And it's for this reason Paul's great concern is to speak into the lives of Christians who are having doubts about the bodily resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And he points out as he writes to these, these Corinthian believers in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he points out to them, he says, there is compelling evidence for the resurrection. Friends, I want to say to you, there is compelling evidence for the resurrection this morning. And you know, there are, are, are a number of different ways we could go about this morning proving that Jesus rose from the dead. We, we could, for example, look at the Old Testament prophecies about the resurrection. And you'll find them in Isaiah, Psalm 16, Jonah chapter 1 and and verse 17, along with Matthew 12, where it speaks about the three days that he would be in the tomb. We could look at the circumstantial evidence for, for the resurrection. We could look at the transformed lives of the disciples, the day of worship for the early Christian church, the preaching of the early church, the growth of the early church. We could say, well, there's, there's so much evidence there. We could look at the, the non-Christian historical evidence, Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, and he writes about Christianity. Or we could look at Pliny, a Roman statesman, orator and writer, as he describes Christian worship. They met regularly before dawn. That get you for those who get up late. They met regularly before dawn on a fixed day, Sunday, in remembrance of the resurrection, to chant verses alternately amongst themselves in honor of Christ and to God. That's what Christians were doing. I mean, people were serious about what they believed. Even so much so that secular historians would recognize and notice what Christians were doing. But I think, and for me this morning, some of the most compelling evidence comes from the people who actually claim that they saw him alive. And for me, the reason this evidence is so compelling is is that in most cases, their unwavering belief that Jesus had physically rose from the dead resulted in unbelievable persecution and suffering, and even for many of them, martyrdom. Friends, you've got to start asking yourself the question, If people are willing to to suffer, if people are willing to give their lives for this, surely they must be serious about it. This wasn't just a figment of their imaginations. 1 Corinthians 15, for I received. What I received, I passed on to you of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and He appeared to Peter and then to the twelve, and after that He appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. In other words, they died. And then He appeared to James, then to all of the apostles, and last of all, He appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. He appears to Peter. Who is Peter? Here's the one who's publicly denied Jesus. Here is the man who who comes to the end of his life and he's about to be crucified for his faith. And he says, crucify me upside down because I'm not worthy to be crucified this right way up like Jesus was. In Luke 24, it says that they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem and they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it's true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Here's a man, one of the men, the 12. uh, Paul says that he appeared to the 12. Do you and you and I all know this morning, most of the 12 were martyred for their faith. You've got Thomas. You remember Thomas? He's the one who, who refuses to believe. He says, you know what? Even though you're all telling me 
that, that you've seen, physically seen Jesus, you know, unless I put my fingers here and if I able to put my hand where they stabbed him into his chest, I'm not willing to believe. And then Jesus appears to him as well. Here's the, here's the man who was really struggling to believe that there could be a physical resurrection of the dead. And afterwards, he's totally convinced. You remember James, the brother of John, is put to death by, by Herod in Acts chapter 12. You've got James, the half-brother of Jesus, who becomes the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Remember what it says about him in John 7 and verse 5. Even his own brothers didn't believe in him. Here's somebody that got converted who wasn't a believer. And then Paul, one of the most ardent opponents of Christianity, whose life is characterized by ongoing hardship and persecution because of his belief in the physical resurrection of Jesus. Friends, these facts are available for anybody that's searching. Anybody is saying, well, is this really true? I want to say to you, have a look at the lives of people to whom he appeared. And I think these facts are also available to those who want to reinforce what they believe. You see, the resurrection will always be under attack until Jesus comes again. It's always going to be under attack. There will always be skeptics who question what Christians believe. And because the resurrection will always be challenged by those who disagree that it is even possible for someone to physically rise from the dead. You see, the resurrection of of Jesus is foundational to the Christian faith. What had happened in, in Corinth, to the Christian community in Corinth, that some people had started to embrace the teaching of the day about the resurrection of the dead. When Paul is writing, he's not he's speaking into a vacuum here. He's, he's addressing what people had started to believe in the church. And what they were saying was that the human body was considered to be a prison. And as such, death was actually welcomed as deliverance from bondage. And this skepticism about a physical resurrection had spilled over into the church. People saying, well, yes, there's a spiritual resurrection, but your body just dies. And when we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, what we're reading is Paul's response to what was happening in Corinth. The fact that Christians were embracing the teaching of the day was impacting their faith and their outlook on life. Friends, when anybody starts to doubt the basics of the Christian faith, it starts to have an impact on our faith, our outlook on life, our belief in what happens after we die, the future, Jesus coming again. It all starts to be affected, and he's deeply concerned as as an apostle, not just because of what they're believing, but because of the impact of what they believe. We read those scriptures together already this morning. How can some of you say there's no resurrection from the dead? If Christ's not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. If the dead are not raised in verse 15, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. I want to say if you've got doubts about it, it's affecting everything. You know what I've realized today is Christians are facing the challenge of the amount of information the digital age has made available to them. You see, I, I, I have a suspicion that people have started to find truth from other places that are invalid. I'm currently reading, and if you, if you get a chance and if you're taking notes, you may want to get a hold of this book. It's called The Next Story, Life and Faith After the Digital Explosion. And the author attempts to explain how life and faith has changed with all the information and media that we're being exposed to. Do you know that there are almost 2 billion human beings who are connected to one another via the internet at the moment? And and literally, there are hundreds of millions coming online each year. That's what you and I are being exposed to. And the result is that Christians have to learn to think a lot more critically and biblically about the new realities brought about by this technology. I want to give you an example of this, and I want to apply to what Paul is proposing about the bodily resurrection of Jesus. In one of the chapters, the author addresses the issue of truth and authority, where Christians have to be a lot more discerning about what they embrace as truth. Today, if you've got a question or an issue to resolve, the, re- the immediate response is, Google it. You got it. You got it. He goes on to show that 
and what he calls the Google, you know what the Google search engine is? Do you all understand what it means? It's, it's, it's a little program and what it does when you go onto Google and you type some name in there. He calls it truth by relevance. Because the way that it works is that it determines the sites that have the highest authority and offer the greatest levels of trust by the way different pages of information live together. It's a mathematical formula. And it's interesting to me how many people are embracing the truth of Google without realizing that they're putting their trust in a mathematical formula and how it's all linking together. And I'm, just in case... You think I'm trying to run down Google? I'm not. I use it all the time. But I think we've got to start being discerning about what we, where we're finding truth from. Let's go on to Wikipedia. You know Wikipedia? It's the electronic encyclopedia, online encyclopedia. He calls it truth by consensus because almost anyone can edit and update an article on Wikipedia. I didn't actually know that until I was reading this. Anybody, if you find an article on, on, on anybody, you can actually go in and you can actually update that. And so it's the consensus of people that adds value to this online encyclopedia. So somebody could put something there without you being able to check the fact. You take that as, as solid information and truth and we hold to it. And so when we are searching for truth on the internet, what we are saying is this offers to us an option of just one of many different truths that might be out there. And I want to say this to you because what was happening in Corinth, I want you to hear, they were beginning to embrace the teaching of the day in their community and their culture. Friends, we are being bombarded with information. I believe Christians have to stop for a while and ask ourselves, what's truth and what has authority in our lives? You see, it is the resurrection that confirms the preaching and teaching of the New Testament writers. It's the resurrection. If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we have found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that He raised Christ from the dead. And although the Christian faith is under attack by some of the most brilliant minds in the world today, I want to say this to you, the facts still speak for themselves. You know why? Christianity is built on facts. It's built on historical facts that can be checked out. It's not just a pie in the sky, a number of ideas that we're holding on to. They are actually facts that can be tested and verified. And all I would like to ask you, if you are skeptical or you have doubts about the Christian faith this morning, start investigating, start by investigating the resurrection. Not evolution, not why there's so much evil in the world, or that there are hypocrites in the church. Start with the resurrection. Start with the facts. Investigate. You see, it's the resurrection that reassures Christians that their faith is not in vain. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You're still in your sins, but Christ is being raised, has been raised. Maybe there are even people here today who for some reason are struggling with doubt. Maybe they're wondering about whether their prayers are even heard. Or that God even cares about what's going on in their lives. Then go back to the resurrection. Look at the amount of evidence for the resurrection. So many people who were willing to suffer and die because they knew it was for real. And when you start getting hold of the resurrection, you will discover something happens to your faith. Allow your faith to be strengthened so that your belief in God can grow. It's the resurrection that reminds Christians there is more to life than this world has got to offer. Friends, I want to say to you, if Paul's whole argument, if Christ is not risen, then let's just live for day, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. It's the philosophy of our world. Friends, Jesus Christ is living, risen. We are living for something better than this world. Don't get too despondent. There's a better one coming. Don't get too despondent. Jesus said there is a resurrection from the dead. Jesus is the first fruits. He is risen and all of us will rise. And there's something better coming for all of us one day. 
only for this life we have hope in Christ. We are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And if the dead are not raised, then let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. <laughs> Go and have a blast. Go and party yourself to death. But I want to say to you, Jesus Christ is risen. You know, when I read the Bible and when I read the New Testament, I realize that the lives that we live today compared to early believers in the New Testament is a walk in the park. The struggles we have, the hardships we have, they pale into insignificance when I read about some of the things that believers were facing because they believed in the resurrection and they believed in a resurrection and they believe people are raised from the dead and they believe Jesus is raised from the dead and they believe he's coming back again. They believe those things and so they said, well, if it's going to cause suffering, we'll rather hold on to that because what, we, what is coming is far better. We do not want to lose that. He writes it to the Hebrews in chapter 11. He said, some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins, goatskins, destitute, persecuted, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in caves and holes in the ground. These were all condemned for their, commended rather for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised because God had planned something better for us. You know what? Your best day on earth when you said that's like heaven isn't even vaguely like heaven. Friends, when people believe in the resurrection, they say I'm believing something way better than what this world has to offer. Friends, may I say to you this morning, if the resurrection is true, then our sins can be forgiven. If the resurrection is true, then you can live with a clear conscience. If the resurrection is true, you can break a bad habit that is holding you in bondage. If the resurrection is true, you can receive all the grace you need to live for God today. If the resurrection is true, the power of God can transform your life beyond beyond what we can even ask or imagine. If the resurrection is true, then there is abundant life in Jesus. Amen. Let's pray together. This morning as we've been focusing on the resurrection and the reality of the resurrection. There might be somebody here who's saying, I just want to surrender my life. I want to embrace Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And there's a very simple way in which we do that. We do that by praying. And as we pray, we put our trust in what Jesus has done on the cross, his death and his resurrection. And there there may be people here this morning, God has just been opening your eyes. The Lord has been speaking to you. And you just sense today is my day. A few weeks ago, a few weeks ago, somebody in Musburg just said, "Today is my day. I want to, I want to put my life in His hands. I want to embrace Him as my Lord and Savior." If you are someone like that today, I want to give you an opportunity to pray a little prayer of committal, a prayer of faith of putting your faith and your trust, your life in the hands of the one who gave himself for us and who is risen from the grave. You can pray these words quietly after me in your own heart. Lord, I want to thank you today for the love of God that has been demonstrated on the cross. When Jesus died in my place, paid the price for my sin. And on the third day, he rose victoriously over death. I want to thank you that you did it for me. You did it so that my sins could be forgiven. You did it so that I could be free. You did it so that I could live with a clear conscience. You did it so that I could be 
reunited to God. Lord, this morning, I come to place my life in your hands because I trust you completely. I believe that you died and I believe that you rose. I believe that you are the son of the living God. And today, Lord, I place my life in your hands. I pray that in Jesus' name. There may be others here this morning. It's something God has put in my heart for, for today. That perhaps you've been struggling with a lot of doubt. And God is saying to you this morning, just focus on the resurrection. Remember the resurrection. Remember that He is risen. Remember He's no longer in a grave. Remember He's seated at the right hand of God in heaven. Remember He's interceding for you 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. Remember that He has risen so that He could not only be the starter of your salvation, but He would bring completion to your salvation. You can trust Him for the beginning and the end and everything else in between. You can rely on Him. <coughs> if doubt has started to get hold of your heart this morning, I want to pray for you. I want to pray that the Holy Spirit will strengthen you. I want to pray that the Lord will minister to you. I want to pray that the Lord will release you from that. I want to pray that the Lord will open your eyes afresh to the truth of the resurrection. That Jesus Christ is risen. And so just where you are, I want to pray for you right now. If that's your struggle, just say, Lord, I'm in a place of doubt. I'm really struggling to believe today. And that's okay. You don't have to be embarrassed about that. Jesus is incredibly gentle and merciful. He's kind and he's gracious. The Spirit of God desires to strengthen you and to minister to you this morning. Way beyond what you could even imagine. And so, Lord, I pray... For people here today who are deeply struggling with doubts, who find it hard to even admit that in case somebody says something about them. But Lord, I want to pray for them this morning. I pray for the powerful ministry of the Holy Spirit in this place. The Holy Spirit who witnesses with our spirit. He's not a spirit that makes us slaves again to fear. But the Spirit who causes us to be able to cry out, Abba, Father, I know He's not. I know He's my Father. I pray, Holy Spirit, that You will minister to Your people, that You will, you will work in people's hearts here this morning. You need to be encouraged. You need to be strengthened. You need to have Your strength to deal with their doubts. I pray that You will do that for them. In the powerful and wonderful name.